airborne transmission was not supposed to be important as far as COVID-19 uh, transmission was concerned. But nowadays, evidence for that is changing. What implications what it has on our day-to-day -day life as we continue to live with this COVID-19 pandemic in the months to come? That's what we are seeing. We would like to see in this presentation. Now, transmission of diseases can occur with direct person-to-person -person transmission. In fact, in COVID also, it can occur from if you touch the person or he, some inanimate objects in which his respiratory, the virus are present around him. For example, he is using some utensils. You use, you touch it, you might get directly from him. Uh, this can be the, the, the for this to prevent this you do hand washing now the second method is respiratory droplets now droplets the droplets happens when you cough and sneezes it can spread droplets of saliva and mucus around and who usually defined it as they have a size more than five microns nowadays they say up to 100 above 100 microns sometimes cdc says it can be up to above 100 microns, whatever it is, above 5 microns. And uh, you usually when you cough and sneeze, it droplets typically fall on the feet, between, within 6 feet. Therefore, the, therefore, if you have a diso keep a social distancing more than 6 feet, which is about a meter, I think you will be able to prevent the disease. These were the principles of uh, uh, prevention as far as COVID-19 was concerned. The other mode of um, spread, transmission, is airborne through inhalation of particles smaller than droplets that remain in the air over distance. Therefore, the airborne transmission, tiny parts, particles possibly produced by talking and are suspended in the air for longer than and travel further. When you talk or when you take a normal breathing also, these particles are released less than five microns according to WHO. Some people say it is less than 100, whatever it is. They remain suspended in air. And the classical diseases which are happening like this is measles, chickenpox, etc. Therefore, what happens is if a person is there in a room or in a lift or in a car and he goes away after some time taking normal breathing and not doing nothing extraordinary, and you walk into the lift, say, next time as the next person, you can get the disease. Previously, airborne transmission was not supposed to be important as far as COVID-19 was concerned. But there is some change. And that's what we will look into it in the today's presentation. One of the important articles which came up regarding this is the airborne transmission. 10 reasons which has been given for airborne transmission in a Lancet article. Actually, this article came in May 1st, 2021 and has been written by a professor of primary care from, uh, from uh, UK. Now, uh, first one is, first evidence she gives is super spreading events account for a substantial COVID-19 transmission. Indeed, such events may be pandemic's primary drivers. The high incidence of such events strongly suggests the dominance of aerosol transmission. Then when you have a super spreading event, it's unlikely to be droplet or contact transmission. Very fast spread, it suggests an aerosol transmission. Another thing is long range transmission of SARS-CoV-2 uh, between people in adjacent rooms, but never in each other's presence had been documented in quarantine hotels. In quarantine hotels, people who have never come in contact, but have been in very far away rooms have also uh, spread diseases, have got, uh, got disease from one person to the other. But there is always a problem in this. There's always a doubt there was a breach in the quarantine. Point number three is asymptomatic or presymptomatic transmission from people who are not coughing or sneezing is likely to account for a third and perhaps 59% of all transmission globally and is a key way of the spread of the virus around the world, supportive of a predominantly airborne transmission. See, when you're not coughing and sneezing, you're not producing droplets. When you're normally, therefore, direct measurement shows that speaking produces thousands of aerosol particles 
and few large droplets which support airborne route. The asymptomatic transmission supports airborne route. Transmission of the virus in higher in indoors than outdoors and substantially reduced by indoor ventilations. Both, uh, both observations support a predominant airborne route of transmission. Nosocomial infections have been documented in a healthcare organization where there have been strict contact and droplet precaution, use of personal protective equipment designed to protect against droplet, but not aerosol exposure. These are all in favor of airborne transmission. The sixth point in favor of uh, scientific reason in support of airborne transmission is viable SARS-CoV-2 COVID virus has been detected in the air in laboratory experiments. And the virus stayed infectious in the air up to three hours with a half-life of 1.1 hour. Viable SARS has been identified in samples from room occupied by COVID-19 patients in the absence of aerosol generating healthcare procedures in air samples from infected persons car also. Now, so the virus has been identified in air filters and building ducts in hospitals with COVID-19 patients, locations which could only be reached by aerosols. And studies, point number eight, studies infecting caged animals that were connected to separately caged uninfected animals via air duct have shown transmission of the virus that can adequately be explained only by aerosols. The authors go on to say that no study to their knowledge has provided strong or consistent evidence to refute the hypothesis of airborne COVID-2 transmission. And controversially, they state there's limited evidence to support other dominant routes of transmission, that is respiratory droplet over from formites. This is a SARS-CoV-2 systemic review, SARS-CoV-2 and the role of airborne transmission. This is published from the University of Oxford and in March 2021. Uh, this was uh, supported, this study was supported by WHO. And they came to the conclusion that the lack of recoverable uh, viral culture samples of the virus prevents firm conclusion to be drawn about airborne transmission. This is used by WHO to quote that there is not absolute, there is no, absolutely there is no evidence of airborne transmission or there's no conclusive evidence of airborne transmission. This conclusion and wide circulation of the review findings is concerning because of the public health implications. This finding by the WHO, which we will come to later, what is the views of the WHO regarding uh, airborne transmission, has been of concern to the authors of the Lancet article. They say in conclusion, we propose that it's a, it is a scientific error to use lack of direct evidence of SARS-CoV-2 in some air samples to cast doubt on airborne transmission because it's difficult to analyze directly the air samples for COVID-19 virus while overlooking the quality and strength of overall evidence base. There is consistent strong evidence of SARS-CoV-2 spread by airborne transmission according to these authors. Although other routes can contribute, we believe that airborne re route is likely to be the dominant one. The public health community should act accordingly without further delay. There's an article in May 1st in 2021 in Lancet. But remember, as we go along, we will find out though that airborne transmission has been, has been supported by CDC and many governments, etc. They do not accept this only article which states that it is the predominant route. It is not considered the predominant uh, route or transmission by most of the recent scientific articles. Let's not go by an isolated article, though in a reputed journal. In a scientific brief, SARS-CoV-2 transmission updated on May 7th, this month very much, summary of recent change, changes by CDC. Uh, we will see what they talk about airborne transmission. It's direct from the CDC. They state, Transmission of SRS-CoV-2 from inhalation of virus in the air further than six feet from an infectious source can occur. Previously, there were 
refuting this. Now they have come about very crystal clear. It can occur. As per published report, factors that increase the risk of this virus infection under these circumstances include what are the factors which increase the risk? Enclosed spaces with inadequate ventilation or air handling within which the concentration of exhaled respiratory fluids, especially very fine droplets and aerosol particles can build up in the, in the air space. There were enclosed spaces with inadequate ventilation, one risk factor. The other is increased exhalation of respiratory fluids. If the infection person is engaged in physical exertion or raises the voice, exercising, shouting, singing, all these are responsible. Remember, that is why gyms are at danger. And when you have uh, singing concerts with people accumulate, then there is also a greater danger. Therefore, increased escalation of respiratory fluids in the, happens in these space. Of course, prolonged ex, uh, exposure more than 15 minutes is another risk factor. Now the CDC, but in spite of all this, the CDC has been clear to the point that most infections are spread through close contact and that airborne transmission is not the primary route of transmission. Remember that in the Lancet article, the author was emphatic that airborne transmission is the most important. No, the CDC says that it, airborne transmission is not the primary route of transmission. And in an editorial Lancet Respiratory Medicine, they have stated in July 2020, over 200 scientists, as early as July 2020, over 200 scientists had published statement calling for international bodies to recognize the potential for airborne spread of COVID-19 as they were concerned that people would not be fully protected by adhering to the current, rec to the current recommendation. This is not something new. Internationally, scientists were worried about this, but de definitely, understandably, the international organization like CDC took more time, some time. Now, let's look at what the World Health Organization has to talk about airborne transmission. Now, a little old one in July 2020, uh, they said recent clinical reports of health workers exposed to COVID-19 index cases not in the presence of aer aerosol generating procedures, found no nosocomial transmission when contact and droplet precautions were apparently used, including wearing of medical mask as a component of the personal protective equipment. These observations suggest that aerosol transmission did not occur in this context. Way back, July 2020. Outside medical facilities, however, such outbreak reports related to indoor crowding spaces have suggested the possibility of aerosol transmission combined with droplet transmission, for example, during choir practice in restaurants or in fitness classes. They are not sure whether it is droplet or, com or it's a combination of aerosol and droplet. And in clinical, in, among health workers, they held, they, their view is that it's only during aerosol generating procedures, like generating procedures, probably like intubation and nebulizers, etc. You get these. Uh, otherwise, there is no risk, according to them, in July 2020. The article goes on to say that normal breathing and talking can results in exhaled aerosol. Thus, a susceptible person could inhale aerosol and could become infected if the aerosol contained the virus in sufficient quantity to cause infection within the recipient. So far, so good. They seem to be agreeing with CDC. But now they go into a negative mood. However, the proportion of exhaled droplet nuclei or, the res or, or of respiratory droplet that ev evaporate to generate aerosol and the infectious dose of SARS-CoV-2 required to cause infection in another person are not known but it has been studied for other respiratory viruses. Therefore, they are not happy. They are not come to the conclusion that it is an aerosol because it is not studied. What they are telling is for viruses like measles and chicken box, this has been studied and they are zero. That is a repro reproduction rate. That is how many patients are infected by one person is 15 for measles, while for COVID-19, it is only two. Therefore, they have their doubts 
the, the it has not been adequately studied. Therefore, they say they even point out to date transmission of SARS-CoV-2 by this type of aerosol route has not been demonstrated. More research is needed given the possible implication of a such a route of such a route of transmission. The WHO therefore seems not fully accepted as far as July 2020 is concerned. They seems to be 50-50. Some of the other statements made by WHO as the short range aerosol transmission, particularly in specific indoor locations such as crowded and inadequately ventilated spaces over a prolonged period of time with infected person cannot be rolled out. Now they say short range aerosol transmission but they don't say whether it can happen above one meter or two meters. Now the role and extent of airborne transmission outside healthcare facilities and particularly in closed settings with poor ventilation also requires further study. Therefore, this is the euphemism for telling that we, they are not fully convinced it requires further study. The advice does not state COVID-19 is never spread by airborne transmission but just it appears less common. They do not state that COVID-19 does not spread by airborne transmission, nor do they completely admit that it does transmit by airborne transmission. You must realize that WHO was initially adamant that airborne transmission of SARS was not possible. The agency tweeted in 28 March 2020, on fact, COVID-19 is not airborne. COVID-19 is not airborne under the caption of fact. The tweet has not been de the deleted and BMJ specifically asked why it has not been deleted. They said it's a policy of WHO that they do not delete their tweets. WHO told them they do not delete any, they do not delete any communication. Now, the sum of the policy can be, if you read the final line, this is the most important statement. As, the agency, as for the agency, the term airborne has a specific medical meaning that applies to diseases such as measles, which transmit predominantly through the air across long distances. Then only you can call them airborne according to WHO. For COVID-19, WHO added the, the virus predominantly spreads through close or direct contact or possibly contaminated surfaces. That is why it is called he does not call it as a uh, as, uh, airborne virus. Therefore, this is very significant because it even now holds on to the fact that it is not transmitted through air over long distances. And it still has the doubt that the uh, when there are outbreaks in quarantine centers, whether it was not because they did not follow proper quarantine. Now let's see what the national governments have uh, are, are, want to say about this airborne transmission and what action they have taken regarding this matter. Now at the time of writing, the UK advises states that COVID-19 spread through the air by droplets and smaller aerosols and notes that infectious particles can remain suspended in the air for some time indoors, especially if there's no ventilation. The government's main publicity public safety messaging of hands face face to remind people to wash their hands wear face mask and keep distance from one another was recently updated to include fresh air to encourage people meeting stay outdoors. Therefore, it seems that UK government has explicitly uh, accepted airborne transmission and may encourage people to meet outdoors than indoors. That's the action which they have given for. Now, if you look at the US, the Center for Disease and CDC updated his advice on 5th October 2020, acknowledging the existence of some published report showing limited, but under uncommon circumstances where people with COVID-19 infected others who were more than six feet away shortly after COVID-19 positive person left an area. In these instances, transmission occurred in poorly ventilated and enclosed spaces that often involved activities and cause heavier breathing, like singing or exercise. Such environment and activities may contribute to build up of virus carrying particles. 
In Australia, the Chief Medical Officer, Professor Kelly, told a Senate inquiry there is no question and never has been a question right throughout the pandemic that aerosol do play a part in the transmission of this virus. This was particularly the case indoors when many people were positive with the virus and places with inadequate ventilation, such as some hotel, such as some hotel quarantine, but Kelly said it was not the key form of transmission. It was not the key form of transmission. This idea that the common, Commonwealth government are all denying that aerosols are important is ridiculous and, and false. They were, it is important, according to him. Now, the president of the epidemiology of COVID illness contradicts the chief medical officer to a certain extent. He says it is droplet spread in most circumstances. If it was mostly spread by aerosol spread, it would be like measles and everybody who walks into a room would get it and we would all have it by now. Yes, in certain circumstances and only limited circumstances, it is airborne spread. This, I think, is a crux of the issue. And therefore, in order to protect people, in order to have a system that works 99.99% of the time, you need to put in appropriate levels of protection. Let's, let's now come to the final and most important part, the preventive aspect of it. How does this all these uh, changing views impinge on the prevention, uh, which affects our day to day life actually. Now the emerging evidence on coronavirus as per CDC USA is a very low risk of transmission from surfaces. That's very important from food and all is from surface transmissions, very low, very low risk from outdoor activities very high risk from gathering in enclosed spaces like offices, religious places, cinema halls, gyms or theaters. See, these are the these findings that have been emerging for a while need to be applied by people to manage the situation in the best possible manner. Time to reduce panic about surface transmission. This is very important, not buying newspapers, uh, soaking vegetables for hours in solutions, and uh, being worried about books, etc. And uh, one has to be not too eager to go back to office because office is a closed space. And especially if it is air conditioned, it can be a source of transmission. Work from home is a very good idea. Now to summarize the prevention of COVID-19, of COVID the old uh, dictums of hand washing, safe distancing and well-fitting masks are still are important. Safe distancing six feet or one meter may not protect you entirely. Even two meter may not protect you entirely because if airborne transmission is one of the methods of transmission and the mask becomes more important because that is the one which really protects you. And that also is a little questionable, but you have to make sure that's a well fitting mask. Now, what does it translate into? You must prefer outdoors. And when you are indoors, you should have adequate ventilation. And when you are in crowded indoor spaces, try to avoid crowded indoor spaces. Now, if you want more emphasis, follow this very carefully. An infectious virus is mainly airborne. An individual could potentially be infected when they inhale aerosols produced when the infected person exhales, speaks, shouts, sings, sneezes, or coughs. It need not cough and sneeze. If it was only droplet, then there would have been necessity for cough and sneeze. When it becomes airborne, even the normal speaking, the normal shouting, even the normal breathing, when you exhale, you can put the, put the virus, but it can spread more than six feet. But don't get very paranoid. This is not the dominant way in which it spreads. Now, now, coming to reducing airborne transmission of virus requires measures to inha avoid inhalation of infectious aerosols. This includes, in, includes ventilation, air filtration, reduce crowding and time spent indoors, use a mask whenever indoors, attention to mask quality and higher grade protection for healthcare staff and frontline workers. Two things I would like to say, air filtration I have not touched Therefore, the, the whole 
offices and hospitals will have to be have a uh, what you call engineering alteration and that the, the cdc and others the scientists say that is the reason why who is not accepting airborne transmission because then they will have to give guidance for how offices should be ventilated how they should have um, uh, checks on that etc they don't they think it is not practicable and that could be the reason why who is not outright accepting airborne transmission and another thing is use a mask whenever indoors this is another problem which we face because many people ask the question how can you use mask when you are at your own house now i found that the medical director dr swaminathan recently in an interview he said if you are in your house and your people you are with your uh, two old parents are there and they are never going out never mixing there may not be a need for using the mask indoors but whenever there is a visitor to house you must as far as possible avoid it but whenever you have people who regularly go outside and come inside in the present state of affairs you might have to use a mask when you are indoors also that seems to be an advice which is not practical now in summary what does the we are now talking about the mask because mask becomes one of the most important things whenever there is aerosol spread becomes one of the factors now who says fabric mask is made and worn properly it can serve as a barrier to droplets expelled from the wearer into the air and environment health workers and caregivers working in clinical area and settings where aerosol generating procedures are performed they should wear n95 ffp2 ffp3 respirator now why a mask now what who says is the normal healthcare worker can work with the surgical mask why if you are doing aerosol generating procedures like intubation or uh, uh, looking at the mouth etc i mean uh, they, they, i suppose that include nebulizers also then you should wear then only you need wear the what you call the n95 which is the term used by the americans and uh, n95 means non oil 95 filters 95% of the aerosols ffp2 means uh, it's more of a Brit, uh, european term it uses filtering phase piece 2 and 3 to 95% three filters about 99% of the uh, viruses but you know it becomes more uncomfortable wearing more and more Uh, uh complicated uh, uh mask for a long time now this is the uh n95 mask which which uh, we we are all familiar with this is the n95 mask with a wear but actually i would call it a selfish mask because here what happens is when you wear the n95 mask for a long time you become a little uncomfortable because breathing becomes a little more uh, requires a little more effort now in during exhalation in this uh, with a van it opens up and therefore the person who wears it it is more comfort he is protected because during inhalation the air goes through the mask and exhalation it comes out through the filter but you know it is a very selfish one banned in some countries because if i myself am infected i will infect the community but i am protected from the community that's not a good attitude to take now this mask looks very benign but it's supposed to be quite effective if, especially if two masks are worn this is called the surgical mask and usually it has two layers of fabric and who says is enough for the health person who are not using who are not doing so uh, aerosol generating procedures and the cloth mask this is supposed to be the least effective even here they they say if you double mask it might be protective but generally try to avoid cloth mask now what does the cdc say now cdc has a slight different as well as the european union as well as the united states of america there's an airborne precaution for any situation involving the care of covid patients however they also consider the use of medical mask as an acceptable option in case of shortage of respiratory mask therefore doctors health personnel nurses note that it is better that with airborne precautions you use n95 or mask when you are working in the hospital 
dealing with patients, even not COVID patients, because I understand in the outpatient as well as in patients, 30 to 50 percent of the patients turn out to be positive. Therefore, it might be as per CDC European consideration, you should use only that mask everywhere. WHO says it's okay to use the surgical mask when you are not producing air, uh, aerosol generating proce uh, procedures. Now a word of caution from the editorial at Lancet Respiratory Medicine in December 2020. I'm fully aware that Lancet editorials are not very popular in India now. But let's look at this. The public health guidance now needs to advise people how to navigate risk in indoor settings and wearing face mask is becoming mandatory in many countries for traveling in public transport, indoor shopping and gatherings. Face mask and shields offer protection from larger droplets, but their effectiveness against airborne transmission is less certain. Therefore, there is a word of caution here. As I'm talking to you, it is flashing on the television. President Biden of America has advised, has told the people, uh, told USA that they need not wear masks in outside, outdoors. But definitely that is not applicable at present to India to most of the other countries because the vaccine we use in India is uh, only about 80, 70 to 80% effective. And we have a population which is highly susceptible as well as infectious. That was highly necessary that we wear a mask whenever we both definitely outside, outdoors and sometimes indoors also. So to summarize the summary, the before I sign off, Airborne as non-dominant transmission is accepted by most agencies and governments, but not entirely by the WHO. And therefore, what does it translate into? Avoid indoor overcrowding and ensure adequate ventilation becomes more important. Avoiding indoor overcrowding and ensuring adequate ventilation becomes more important. With this, we come to the end of the COVID-19 update regarding airborne transmission. I hope it has been useful to you. In the next presentation, I would like to look into the interval between the first and second dose of COVID-19. There seems to be a lot of uh, speculations and uh, doubts in the minds of the public of, uh, regarding this. And there seems to be, the public seems to be doubting the intentions of the government. We would look into that from a scientific point of view in the next presentation. And as you can, my other YouTube presentation educational videos can be found in this link. Thank you. Till we see next time and goodbye.